thank you all so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to this panel. I think it's so important that we talk about foundations. You cannot have a strong house without a strong foundation. Um, I would like to welcome my esteemed panelists and preface this by saying, um, I think that I, and I'm sure we all are aware that you cannot discuss something within a system without you know, taking into account the thing that we are working into. So you can't talk about the legal system or any kind of system without talking about where we function, which is Nigeria, the culture in which we function um, and the way we, we kind of are shaped by the country itself and not just, you know, taking the, the, the legal system as a silo, as an island. So I do have that in mind, but being that we are specifically talking about the legal system, we will try today to talk about solutions and the impact that educational um, institutions can have on the legal sector. Okay. Are you all with me so far? Thank you very much. All right, we shall now begin. So, um, I mean, as, it, as was mentioned in the, the speeches beforehand, one of the places we spend the most time of, in our lives is in school. And that is where I think some of the most pivotal shaping of our, um, our, our, our sort of mindset comes. And so I wanted to start with you, Professor Agoma, and ask you, in that you've been, you know, you've had so much experience in supervising, in teaching, and in taking part in some of these things like the Senate, um, where do you think truly real change will come um, with our academic institutions in making sure that we build a solid foundation so that students are empowered to A, think of themselves as different but equal um, and empower the students, empower the women, for example, to speak up and speak out and the men to be not just silent bystanders but actual allies in making sure that when they also see something that they are able to support. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that just is straightforward and it requires a short answer. It starts from the home. It starts from the home. How you train your children is very important. And the women are the culprits, let me put it this way. Traditionally, you train the male differently from the female. What he's supposed to do, what she's supposed to do. You are a female, you are a boy, you are a girl, and that. So if we then when we talk of changing the narrative, we must start from the home because that's where the socialization process, values are set, everything are set. When we train our children to realize that they are equal, it may be different gender, different sex, but you are still human beings created in the image of God, equal. And so no one is superior to the other, have mutual respect for one another. I think that's where it starts, from the home. That's where the education starts. The real education is from the home. And now, but being that, you know, they spend so much time in schools, um, it's fine if you're sort of, you've got an idea from home that this is how you should be and this is how, you know, you should function. But when you're in school, in such a, at such a pivotal time, when you're exposed to so many other different people and you're plunged into a whole new world, as it were, what do you think the environment around the school needs to, to do to make sure that, okay, some of the things that they may have learned at home is either, as you mentioned earlier, sort of entrenched or you know, even turned on its head? Is there not a place for universities to train their teachers to make sure faculty are also not um, unconsciously or consciously teaching some of these harmful behaviors so that then you know you now empower a workforce that's going out to say well i know this is what kind of happened at home but i've learned better i've learned different so is there not a place for that and where do you think how do you think universities need to go ahead and start teaching training teachers faculty everyone in the school system to to do things differently we talked about the, uh, the curriculum you know you have to unlearn so universities, secondary schools, institutions teach you to unlearn what you have learned earlier so you can relearn the new culture. We are talking of getting rid of the old culture to have a new culture. But before you can do that, you must get rid of that old culture. And the environment of the universities, the tertiary institutions, secondary schools, must be such that speaks that language, that things have to be done differently. It's not business as usual. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so I would like to ask Mrs. Okorocha and Mr. Candy Johnson. So, I mean, both of you are, you know, you have long legal careers. Where do you think that the, the institutions of say, the MBA or just the law, the legal profession, where do they come in, especially with partnering with universities, for example, to say, okay, we need to start from, we need to get them when they're students, right? We need to tweak, you know, maybe not just curriculums, but mentorship programs, things like that, and actually go in and say, this is where we need to step in to make sure that we can action some change. I'm so sorry. Um, I got your question and I will address it, but I want to flow from what Prof said. Because Prof actually hit the nail on the head. If we're going to really tackle this problem, jumping to university as to where to start the training just won't work. That training and unlearning or relearning or learning from the scratch has to start from that infancy stage. Because by the time you get to university, you're already formed. Do you understand? So, so, so that training and then the lecturers, are, of course, they're all formed. And we as practitioners, we're all formed and set in our ways. So if we're going to achieve the change that AWB wants to achieve, it has to go back to the basics. It needs to go back to our homes. You know, we ourselves, me, myself, I can remember when I was growing up, my, my, my brother was older than me, but, but when my mom is going out, she will say, Chinyere, take care of your siblings. <laughs> Do you understand? Meanwhile, I'm younger than him. You know, so that cultural background has a lot to do with where we find ourselves today. So that training starts from the home. And then when you get into the primary school, it should also be part of the learnings and the teachings. And if perchance what you learnt at home doesn't support you know, is a negative example. Maybe your parents are not showing you the example or the teachings you should. Then perhaps you'll catch it at your primary school stage or secondary school. You know, so it needs to be inculcated into our curriculums very early because those students that you are in the uh, tertiary institute institutions, primary and secondary school, they're the ones that will enter the university, they're the ones that will become the lecturers of tomorrow, they're the ones that become the lawyers of tomorrow and the workforce, and if you haven't imbibed those correct practices and, and, uh, and discipline as to how to treat women, I'm a woman, I know that men also suffer from sexual harassment, but I'm speaking on behalf of the women today, if you haven't learned how to treat a woman um, properly, by the time you get there, then you're almost a lost cause. Um, you, you know, so I wanted to start there, so sorry about that. Okay, so in terms of the professional institutions, um, apart from being a lawyer in private practice, I'm also a member of the MBA. And you may know that the MBA recently released what we call a sexual harassment policy. And, and it became so necessary to, to, to actually focus on that aspect of, of, of societal, what, what would I call it, imbalance or injustice or inequity um, for our women in particular because um, it had permeated every level of, of, the, of, the, of the legal profession. You know, you have lawyers who, um, you know, when they go on, 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 um, out of town, you know, to, to court with their senior male colleagues, and if the person happens to be their boss, they only, um, what, what did they say? They only um, uh, pay for one room. You understand? And you're going on a, a litigation matter with your boss. He books only one room for crying out loud. You understand? You know, or there was one pathetic case where the woman, a young lawyer spoke about, um, she went for a, 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 um, uh, an interview, and everybody knew that when you go for an interview, if you're a woman, that he puts you through a test. And the test he puts you through is he has a ladder and he has law books. You know, we lawyers, we like books. And then he makes you climb up the ladder. He'll tell you to go and get him the law report on the top shelf. And obviously, he's sitting down. And then you climb the ladder and you're wearing a skirt for crying out loud. I mean, just these are real life cases. You know, so um, the MBA is very focused on trying to stamp out um, sexual harassment um, as, uh, um, you know, a scourge, really. Um, and so the professional bodies do have a role to play. And I guess I'll speak more 
to what is inside that policy, what the MBA is doing, um, but let me not take up too much time at this, at this particular stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I expected that on a panel like this, I would be, and I would feel like Daniel in the lion's den. But if, if I will keep with the biblical um, context, I know that confession comes before redemption. There is a problem. One of my favorite quotations is um, Simone de Beauvoir, I think in 1949, who said that erotic desire is both the driving force and the Achilles heel of the human male. And it's a fact. It's a fact of nature. And, but one would have assumed that um, when, when a feminist intellectual of that stature writes about something as far back as 1949, she is identifying a problem which it is the obligation of civilization and a renewed acculturization to modify, to moderate, or to abolish. Um, some of these stories that, that I've heard, uh, including the, the type that you just mentioned, I realize that they're quite rampant. Um, I was told recently after having this discussion with some of my colleagues that there's a very senior lawyer who has a bedroom next to his office or a law firm in Lagos which hires women according to their looks and um, dedicates these women to what can only be properly described as sexual abuse. Um, I, I, I have no uh, quarrel with consensual sexual behavior between adults. But in a certain power context, sexual relations must be presumed to be coercive. And sexual coercion comes in a variety of means. Um, bullying, um, very often sexual harassment is a form of bullying. Um, it comes in the form of um, other exploitation, you know, career impediments, um, persistent requests. Uh, I believe fundamentally in consent. I believe fundamentally in the equality of men and women. And, uh, of course, I'm the father of daughters, so this would go without saying. On, on, on my dinner table, discussions about the patriarchy and the gender pay gap are quite common. And these are instrumentalities um, of oppression. And in the workplace, they play into coercion. If a woman who is 50 or 60 can face sexual harassment or an appropriate approach from, from a man in a public space, imagine what is faced by a junior lawyer or, or some other person or a clerk. And, and honestly, I, I'm personally ashamed that these things can happen. But then, you know, you have to recognize something. You cannot find a solution unless you identify a problem. And this sin is one that we dare not speak of. This is why this event is so important. It's important for women to take on the challenge of confronting something to which they are the particular scourge and it is important for men to participate and to say publicly that there is something bad about this sort of behavior and that something ought to be done about it. So this is something, the recognition is very important. This is why I say confession comes before redemption. And, and I hope I can take the handcuffs off now, un, un, unshackled by my confession that there's something wrong. As to what to do, I think that we have many laws. I know that Chinyere will talk about the sexual harassment policy. I have a sexual harassment policy in my office. In many places, I'm surprised that, that, that the, question, the, the, the underlying question of equality and fundamental human rights, which is the foundation of these issues, is still being negotiated at this stage in life. It shocks me because I thought, you know, in 2007, I, did, I was head of a, of, a, of a committee to review a case of sexual harassment in VGC. And this was 2007. And I thought, look, you know, it was, it was so current at that stage that I thought that it was not, and we had to analyze it, what it was, and identify whether the behavior, which was often subtle and often um, covert, amounted to sexual harassment. And we did. But then I'm surprised, really, that in 2021, we can hear that a lawyer will book a room for himself and his junior. This is actually criminal behavior. But then the point about an event like this is beyond the instrumentality of law, its interpretation. It's about enforcement. You know, you cannot enforce any law without political will. And political will is created by the polity. Now, you talk about women being 50% of the population. 
Are they participants in the politics to the extent that they can put their imprint upon how we respond? The governor of Lagos State, the president of Nigeria, they issue executive orders. What is an executive order? He has no legislative power. It is an, a directive to organs of states to enforce the law with a particular degree of importance or seriousness and how to do so. That's what it is. The power is in the hands of men by and large if women don't participate in the politics. Political will is the only way that laws are enforced to protect women. And the only way to force the hand of that will is to participate in the politics of the country. You can't sit back and, and you know, another thing I have to say is that because we keep talking about women, I, organizations like Elect Her, etc. what do we do? Getting women into office, asking for, for um, female lists for, for, for percentages. You don't have to persuade people to do what is in their own interest. And why do women, why are women afraid of violence and intimidation even in the political space? I have a friend um, who's here who's a politician and, and I was present when someone asked that, someone asked how safe does she feel in politics because they will threaten her with violence. And being a hard head, her response was they should worry about their own safety too. Now why do you think you see, gender assignment is not natural, it's political. The role you assign for a woman, you are to cook amala, and you are to sit down there naked, pregnant, and in the kitchen. These are patriarchal assignments because the patriarchy, of which I must admit I am a member. But then at some point out to me the other day, a woman, and she said this, having related to me some instance she faced in the National Assembly, she said the majority of women are foot soldiers of the patriarchy. So it is women who will compel you to succumb to these things. What is wrong with you? Is he the first man? All six of you before, they did the same thing. You are just a junior. Do you not want to be SAN? He will help you. Well, these are things that have to be resisted in a constructive way. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I've rambled on for far too long, but thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for, um, I mean, I guess here we are, we, we're not, unfortunately, you know, with enough time and the, uh, I guess, breadth of people to discuss things like, you know, starting from home and political will. And so, I guess my next question is, what now, what next, right? How do we move the needle? When does zero tolerance truly become zero tolerance? How do we make sure that Whatever they've learned, bad behavior, when, whenever they get to university and they've learned that bad behavior, they know that there is a consequence for that bad behavior, and that consequence or those consequences are enforced. Now, how can bodies like the NBA, how does the university, do you see a real will? Do you see it as just a policy? And then how do we make sure, or how do the universities, how are they going to enforce these things? How are they going to say, oh, it's not going to be a slap on the wrist, and you go away for two months and then come back and everyone's forgotten about it? Is there real... Is there a real will behind these things? And, and what, is that, what is that going to look like for us in the future, for academia and you know, for bodies like the MBA, for, for, for you know, partnerships, for offices? Well, I, I think that the time is now. It's not something that one institution can do alone. But it's like the body. You have the head, you have the eyes. Each one has a function. So it's, it's got to be a synergy. That's why I said this is a movement. We have become a movement. We have become a community. But there are reservoirs or there are places where you have to start from. Who have fundamental functions, have things to do. The institutions, yes. Like Unilag has a sexual harassment policy. Every institution must have a sexual harassment policy. I have always said it's not zero tolerance in mouth but that there are structures on ground that will say, if you do this, these are the consequences, and you will follow through. Um, I, See it well, that's, it's going to take time, but that's where we're talking of programs, advocacy, changing the curriculum. I remember when I introduced um, gender issues in the workplace. Um, reproductive health issues, my um, LLM class. I had a challenge. Someone said, this woman has come again. 
Then I had to explain and I said, look, it's not about them and us. I'm talking about development issues, a holistic, putting our best foot forward. And I still have a clipping. It's in, I think, Punch. It's about a Nigerian couple based in the UK. The man gave up his job so that the wife, who's a medical consultant, could keep the job. Well, he said, I am a house husband. It's my calling, as it were. He said he realized that his wife was trying to maintain that with that patriarchy, her place in the home as a wife, as a caregiver to the children, and still having that heavy load of work. And I think she had, it was a sickle or something like that too. A lot of, so she realized the quality of home life was next to zero. He was a graduate, all right, but he was not making it as it was. So he thought to himself, he didn't discuss with the wife. He decided to give up his job so he can concentrate on the home, give the wife. And the change was, when I read it to my students, I said, aha, these are people for undo origin but now based in the UK. I said, look, that's why we say that systems, we must change the way we think before we can come to realize. That's why I emphasize that on learning to relearn. And so the universities has a fundamental role to play. Changing the curriculum, it's not business as if you're teaching it to the way we've taught it over the years. Because I'm sorry, say, the law of labor relations, like I said, it changed completely from what it was. Once, I, because I attended a training program at the International Labor Organization, I said, human rights at work. And so I brought it, and it changed it. And you now have, to, most universities can begin by changing the curriculum, begin to produce change agents. We are talking of change agents, people who will become apostles and disciples of what, and take it wherever they go. Things cannot continue that same way. But yes, it starts from the institutions. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, I, I think uh, in response to the question, what can be done, um, I think we need to look at the whole ecosystem surrounding sexual harassment. Um, so fixing just one part of it, like having the laws, because we are a society and there is the rule of law. So just having the laws isn't enough. Because the fundamental question you need to ask is, why aren't these cases being reported? And when they are reported, what happens to the victim? Do you understand? So until, I mean, we all know about the Me, Me Too movement, isn't it? it? You know, that became an international phenomenon. But that was because people chose to speak up and um, I guess the number of them kind of was able to silence the criticism, the shame, and everything that goes with being a victim. But in our society, I remember around that Me Too movement time, Someone made the flip comment, eh, they should come to Nigeria now, let's see, something like that. You know, so unless we address it as an entire ecosystem, you know, that, you know, the naming and the shaming of the, of the perpetrator, and then the, the shame and the, you know, providing some sort of mental health support um, for the victims, such that you're not stigmatized, because nobody wants to, look at that question, don't you want to be an SAN? Do you understand this, how the people before you have done it and all that? And so there's so many incidences, but people remain silent. It's in your best interest to remain silent, or is it? If my daughter told me today that this happened to her, would I be among the people to say, don't talk about it. Would I really, would, can I in all honesty say I will bring her out, you know, and expose the incident, you know, to the, you know, for people to now be using her as an example of, you know, so, so the whole thinking, maybe it's the unlearning, you know, but I guess these are the things that make it um, enable the, 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 the oh, virus to, to grow, so to speak. So yes, the, you know, one of the places to start is to have the laws in place, 
but there's also the enforcement of the laws. How do you now take it from just being something written on the paper? After all, the National Assembly, uh, they, they passed the sexual harassment law. Is it last year or something like that? Um, we all know the case, you know, that came to light in the universities from the BBC, you know, getting it on radio. But can we actually say that it's no longer going on in universities today? I, I don't know the answer, but I, I dare say perhaps not. So, so, so for, for just having the law or exposing one or two cases is not going to do it. It needs to be a national movement. Just the way we all gather together during the Ebola crisis and I dare say the um, COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it was a national um, emergency and everybody, the government, leadership, everybody put hands together to find a solution. Until we get to that place, where more people like AWB, the MBA, other professionals, the universities, you know, a national policy, you know, you know, talks like this that bring it to the fore, you know, and deal with the entire ecosystem. There'll be people like the Mirabel Center to come into use right. and all that, you know. Um, th those are just my thoughts. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I know that we are pretty much in our Q&A time, but I did want to hear very briefly from Mr. Candy Johnson about what I'm saying. I mean, we know that there is a need for these things. We know that there's a need to enforce things and there's a need for consequences. Do you truly think that we are ready for that? Do you think that's even going to happen in... I mean, do you see bodies like anything that you're involved in or with the MBA since you're all... With, with partnerships, with, um, with law firms. Do you see that happening? Do you see that change? Do you see that willingness to relearn and unlearn and, and adapt the new language, things like allyship and he for she, the, truly? The, I would only say truly. <laughs> the, the world is getting smaller than people can, can, can bear or they can imagine. Um, I'm glad that um, Professor Goma referred to the ILO to which Nigeria, Nigeria is a party to the International Labour Convention and the International Labour Organization. And this is an organization which believes that human rights should be implemented in social, po social policy, especially in the workplace. Um, in 2019, the International Labour Organization passed the Violence and Harassment Convention. It is in effect because three countries have ratified it, but Nigeria has not. That's an organizing issue. Why has Nigeria not ratified the Harassment and Violence Convention. It's important because it places a burden on governments and the entities within government to enforce those things which guarantee the right of women in particular in the workspace because it is recognized that the safety of the workspace includes safety from emotional, from sexual, economic, and other forms of intimidation and harassment. Is, there, is, it, is it the time? I really think it is. I think that, again, it's no longer a quiet thing. People are willing to say it, you know. And people, I know, uh, one of my colleagues who will speak here hereafter will tell you about a case of sexual assault where she was able to obtain a significant result. The fact is that uh, I know that the victim in that case was, was so traumatized as to have been psychologically impacted by it. But then the, the accountability is a bomb. The fact that somebody is held responsible is very important. And this is an obligation of everybody in society. Now, does it work for us? Does this regime where women, a, a, more than 50% of the population, are, are commoditized, sexualized, and placed in a position of natural inferiority where their progress is impeded as a matter of culture, does it work for us? It's clear that it is not valuable for us economically, politically, or socially. If that is the case, then why do we not need to find solutions? I think it is the... It is the necessity to find solution that comes from, the, the, we, the problem is one that is affecting us adversely, and that is why we will find solutions, and it's a worldwide movement. Thank you very much. We didn't get through all the questions, but um, I think we may have time for two questions. About, she, Isabella is like, one question. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions? I've got one here. Yeah. Okay, if we're gonna take one question, we'll take one from you. I'm not sure what our format is for the question. Someone's coming up with a mic to ask. Hi, good morning and thank you. I enjoyed um, the conversation. The question is, what is the process for a person who 
is meant to be held accountable. What are the charges? How does it go through the system um, from initial report? Okay, I can speak for the MBA sexual harassment policy, which was just, um, I guess, uh, released a month ago. And so what we've basically done, what the president of the MBA has done is to institute an implementation committee, which is, I think it's a six panel committee who's now going to go into in depth into the, the recommendations made in the policy and now, you know, roll it out nationwide. But one of the things I know that happened that is inside the policy, a recommendation, as it were, um, would be ultimate debarment, you know, which means you cease being a lawyer, there might be criminal sanctions involved, you know, so, um, yes, so, so in terms of the MBA, yes, that's what we're hoping. Um, in terms of the, the society in general, I think the Labour Act doesn't have anything on sexual harassment, but we base it on, is it uh, nah, something Labour, is it the IO? ILO. ILO, is it? Oh, the IO, okay. Yes, yes. So I, I don't have, you know, what the sanctions are under that. I don't know if, if, you, if you do. But it's a Did you mean in general, act, like not? a general, just a regular general. person, Joe Public, somebody gets, you know, assaulted in the workplace, for example. What is the what is the process? So is it is it a, is it first to go to HR or is it no go straight to yeah, well, uh, well, police? Well, everything has degrees. So it depends on the degree of the event. Certainly, every workplace must have it incumbent upon them to create processes for internal investigation, and and they must make it, HR has a role. The leadership, you cannot do anything in any organization without the leadership signing on. The leadership of an organization must make it known that there is no tolerance. They must make it known that complaints will be listened to, they will not be brushed aside, they will be investigated and taken seriously. You know, another thing is that is said, that something my daughters tell me very often is that you must always believe women. Because Part of the order of things is that she's being hysterical. It's, 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 it's not as serious as she thought. She just said, what's wrong with you? you know, the fact is that the simplest assault, as a matter of law, touching somebody on an inappropriate place is it against, it's a criminal act. So why would it be in a workplace that you consider such an act to be just a tap? You know, so every, the workplaces have degrees. There must be procedures. They must be publicized and the steps must be made clear. And the NBA needs to make a campaign to demonstrate that there is a buy-in to this code they have published, that no matter whose ox is gored, because there are big people who are in this country too big for the law. If the, the NBA has inherent sanctions, the disciplinary process can work. You know, in UK last year, a senior lawyer who went out drinking with a junior lawyer and had a consensual sexual relationship with her was struck off. Consensual sexual relationship. Now, we have a case here where the behavior by which these acts are achieved is, cannot properly be described as consensual. Um, if the fact someone saying yes um, is not the end of the question of consent, you have to determine the circumstances How the yes which that came was about, right. Thank you very much. I hope we were able to answer your question. I don't know that we have time for another because I've seen some hands go up, but Isabella's by my side, y'all. You know, she's no, tough. Do I have... We're out of time, unfortunately. I'm so sorry that we're out of time and we can't take all your questions, but I really appreciate you all for being so um, kind and listening to everything that we had to say. I'm sure that you can grab somebody just off the side and get them to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Prof. Agomo. Thank you, Mrs. Okosha, and thank you, Mr. Kenny Johnson. Thank you so much to everyone and have a wonderful rest of the event. Thank you very much. Awesome.